Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fabulous episode of the Healthcare Trailblazers podcast. I'm very happy to be sitting here today with the uh, Dr. Henry Buchwald. Henry is uh, a lot of things. Henry is a doctor, a surgeon, a professor, and a published author. And uh, we're going to get a chance to hear a little bit about uh, Henry's experiences. And uh, the book is called Healthcare Upside Down and talks about Henry's view of healthcare today, the way it stands today, and hopefully some ways that we can possibly turn it around. So Henry, thank you so much for sitting with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Mendelin. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. So let's, let's go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up and why healthcare? Uh, well, I grew up in New York City. Um, my first work experience was on the docks of Sheepshead Bay. At age six, I helped them unload fish. I brought home dinner and then grew up in uh, Brooklyn, Flatbush. Uh, there I, I got my PhD in self-defense. And uh, then we moved to Upper Manhattan. Uh, I went to the Bronx High School of Science and then Columbia College. Columbia Medical School, Columbia Internship, uh, then left New York, went into the Air Force, served two years on flying status in Strategic Air Command, you know, the ones with the B-52 bombers, and uh, that was a wonderful experience. And then came to Minnesota in 1960 for my surgical residency. I've never left. I love the Midwest. My family loves the Midwest. And so here we are, and um, I've just recently taken emeritus status at the university. Um, and through these years, I've, as you said, been a clinician, a surgeon, uh, a researcher, and a writer. And I, I've tried to put some of my experiences into writing. And so I thought I should write this book, Healthcare Upside Down, because in my lifetime, Healthcare has been turned upside down. Uh, it's no longer patient oriented. Uh, it's no longer serving the patient. It serves an administration. It's run on a business model. And uh, this book starts with statistics to show you why we as a nation, we always say, oh, we're number one, we're number one. We're not number one. We're way down on the list in healthcare, and I can, you know, w w we can do some statistics to start with, but uh, every aspect of healthcare, clinic, doctor's office, hospital, the payers, uh, how we handled COVID, uh, all shows that we're not paying attention to the patient, and we could do so much better. We have done better. And it's foolish to ask people to return to the past. You can never return to the past, but we can go into the future. Um, so describe, you say we've done better. Describe when you started out, in your view, when we were doing better. Describe what that patient experience looked like. Well, <clears throat> if you became a patient, you had a doctor. And you had a doctor-patient relationship. And, and what does that mean? You identified with an individual. And that person gave you their trust. I'm going to tell you all about myself. I'm going to tell you my problems. And I hope you can help me. That's what a patient does. And the physician said, my patient... Now, this wasn't a sign of possessiveness. It meant I take responsibility. You are my patient. And so when I was a surgeon, uh, active surgeon, uh, I saw my patient in clinic. We discussed what's going to happen. Then the patient came in for surgery. I saw the patient before the operation. Now, one of my daughters recently had surgery, wonderful surgeon, but he didn't come in to discuss anything with her before surgery. He was too busy operating because he was making money for the firm. 
And so after surgery, I saw my patient. Today, many don't. And then afterwards, the care is left to somebody else. And, and so that doctor-patient relationship has been shattered. And, and that's the basis of it. And it's all because the business of healthcare has taken over, and we as a population have accepted it. We wouldn't accept this way of buying a car. You wouldn't go into a dealership and the dealer says, I'm going to give you this car, and this is how much it's going to cost, and that's it. But we do this with health care. You wouldn't go to a movie under those circumstances where they tell you, we'll tell you what picture you're going to see and where you're going to sit. Right. No. But let, let's talk about the money then, because at the end of the day, uh, there's value to healthcare being a business in the sense that from a from it, it incentivizes people to go through medical school because they want to be successful and you want competent people coming through. So when 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 healthcare was better, right back what, what, when you're describing the, the good patient doctor relationship, where this is my doctor and my doctor is going to care for me, and you and you you saw your doctor, how did the doctor get paid? What what was the difference in the the, the payment structure? Well, you know, we, we have this myth in our society uh, that uh, we don't like socialized medicine. Well, I don't like socialized medicine, but 60% of our medicine is socialized because Medicare medical assistance is socialized medicine. It's paid through taxes. Armed forces are paid through taxes. VA hospitals are paid through taxes. Indian service. There are various children's services. Uh, all this is paid for through taxes. So in other words, how does the doctor get paid? 60% of the time from the tax pool. That's where it goes. And we pay 17% for second-rate medicine. And let me in a couple of minutes give you those statistics or just a brief number of them. Uh, we pay 17% of the gross national product, whereas the closest country... Uh, Switzerland and Germany pay 11, 12 percent, and they get much better health care. Uh, so, uh, first of all, it's 60 percent is paid for by some taxes. Then there's personal insurance. And the insurance, uh, very often the individual does not arrange for it. They belong to a company, and the union makes a deal for the insurance. And sometimes the deal says, well, we won't pay for obesity surgery. We won't pay for prior heart attacks or something. So that's not in the patient's interest. And then finally, after having collected tax money, personal money for insurance policies, you go and see a doctor today, and before you can see him, there's a co-payment. <laughs> so you got to pay him some more money. Well, first got to get your deductible. Then you get lucky enough to only get the copay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so the people who can afford it, you know, healthcare should not be based on money pay, uh, in a sense that healthcare sh should not, uh, the wealthy shouldn't get better healthcare. I mean, I, I believe that. Well, and yet, let, let's today, get to that for a second. But, but, but before we get there, I, I'm trying to, trying to wrap my head around what the good model that you started out with looked like. So specifically from a financial perspective. When the patient-doctor relationship was in a better place, how did the doctor get paid, and how is that different from today? Well, the our billing service or my secretary would put in a bill to the insurance company or to Medicare or to medical assistance or to the Indian Health Service. I mean, we live in Minnesota. We have a number of patients that are through the Indian Health Service, or uh, that's how we would get paid. Uh, it was a, a fee for service. And today, if you want fee for service, th there's a, a new thing out, as you well know, concierge medicine. In other words, uh, there are some concierge doctors who make exorbitant amount of money before even seeing one patient, just for the privilege of having the same doctor-patient relationship everybody had in the past. That's wrong. 
in my opinion, that's wrong. Well, my, my understanding from speaking to a lot of these concierge doctors is that the reason why doctors are interested to move to a concierge model is actually because the system is so broken. They're sick and tired of of having to know every code and every way to bill and that the, to make sure that everything is, is, is done correctly so that they actually get paid for their time. And uh, that's, that's why they're moving to concierge because that are, they're saying, I, I didn't go to medical school to, to learn how to code. I went to medical school to learn how to care for patients. And, and a lot of doctors feel like in the current environment, it's very difficult to focus solely on caring for patients. And if they're not getting those 15 minute slots and coding correctly and spending hours outside of actual patient care, doing administrative work essentially and fighting with insurances for prior authorizations, et cetera, um, they're, they're sick and tired of it. So I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily uh, greed on the doctor's part. I think it's actually very often the opposite where doctors are saying, I just want to care for my patients. I can't do this. I can't just keep you know, be staying on top of the billing. I want to stay on top of patient care. So they move to a concierge model. I uh, respectfully disagree with your analysis. Uh, first of all, they usually have a billing service, and they very, very, very rarely does any doctor spend any time billing. They have a billing service, which costs them money. But the concierge doctors take in the concierge privilege of having them answer the phone, and in addition, they charge. So a concierge doctor can make $800,000 without seeing a patient, just for the privilege of seeing a patient. And then when they see the patient, they still will charge the patient's insurance because these patients usually are not on medical assistance or they will charge Medicare because a lot of patients are older. So they will double charge in a sense. Right. So concierge medicine isn't a, uh, I want to help my patient solely. Sure, that may be part of the motivation, but it's certainly the money. If they want that, just offer personal care, but don't charge for it. That's what, what we all did for centuries. We offered personal care. But we didn't say just to see me, you have to pay. So a couple points to, to your original point. While it's true that the doctor isn't the billing company, they have a billing company. That's not what I'm referring to by coding. The doctor has to code correctly the complexity of the patient's uh, problem list, make sure that the patient's uh, diagnoses are up to are up to date and not just up to date, but with the proper complexity codes and ICD-10 codes there. You, you know, it's not just diabetes. You got to have the very specific code for what level of complexity diabetes is. And all that makes a big difference in the bigger picture for the billing of how exactly they're going to be reimbursed. So it's becoming more and more complex where in the post visit notes, the doctor has to know a lot of these things so that the billing company can actually get them the correct reimbursement. Um, and, and, and going to the concierge model again, I mean, a hundred percent, there's different doctors in different ways, but as again, I, I, I speak to a good amount of these doctors and I would say that there's definitely a solid, um, a solid, uh, group of doctors, I would say even even the majority that I've spoken to, not that I've spoken to everyone in the country, that the concierge model to them is a way to get away from the, the rat race of medicine. Because if you're not, if you're in a system where you have to be doing 15 minute time slots in order to keep your practice afloat, then um, then th they don't feel like that's good patient care. So that so to to what to the model that you're describing, that hybrid model where you pay me a flat fee and then I'm your guy and you can call me 24 seven. You can come see me whenever it is. I'll come to your house. I'll do whatever services. Right. And then in addition, I'm, I'm charging the insurance that actually allows me to take much fewer patients and say, OK, now I actually have time for all these patients. So I just don't want to vilify all the doctors out there. I think that there's I think that there's uh, I'm sure there are doctors that are solely in it for the money. Um, um, I think clinically they call them plastic surgeons. <laughs> so I mean, they're my peer group. <laughs> I've been a doctor all my life, practically. I don't want to vilify my fellow doctors. Yeah. And, and, and they're, and in a sense, you know, I agree with you. They're reacting against the system. Yeah. Which is what I wrote this book to show the system is upside down. And they're reacting by going back to a system. In other words, when you say they don't want to get into the rat race, that meant what you're saying, there was no rat race. 
And now they're being put into the maze and told to run through the rat race. And they say, I don't want to. So basically, they are saying what I'm saying. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm not enamored with the solution of concierge medicine, but it is a solution. Yep. But it is a, a prejudiced solution because m- many people can't afford concierge medicine. It's it's like adding a, an insurance policy on top of an insurance policy. Yeah. So before we get into the 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 money um, and and whether healthcare should be revolving around money or not, which I think is going to be a fascinating discussion, there's one other conversation piece that I've that I've discussed with some people. That I'd love to hear your thoughts on. And by the way, I agree with you with a lot of this, um, but but just kind of trying to put the full context in here. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. The thought is that a, the degradation of the, uh, the the doctor-patient relationship, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the doc, the, the PCP today is almost like a um, uh, is almost is almost like a, a re, just a referral center to a certain regard to various specialists. There's become so many specialists. Mm-hmm. And I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, you know, 40, 50 years ago, whatever it was, the PCP was the primary care physician. You took care of me. And and, and, and there was very, very uh, few times that I had to maybe see somebody else. And if there was a specific surgeon that I had to go to, like you mentioned, you were there. You were there before. You were there after. You were there during. And you really cared because you kind of took care of my comprehensive health. Um, the, the argument is that this is actually because of the advance of science and, and medicine that we've come to learn so much more about human biology and medicine that now that's created all these subspecialists, even within specialists, there's all these subspecialists and there's doctors that literally just focus on one tiny nerve or one tiny bone or one tiny, you know, uh, 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 system. And, uh, and we just know so much more that it's impossible for the primary care doctor to actually cover everything at this point. And that's why healthcare is starting to look like that. What are your, what are your thoughts? On, on on that argument. Well, you've just given my argument. Uh, thank you. Uh, because the patient today comes in and recites his problems, and as you say, it's a referral. And they get referred to what has been called a line service. So let's say they have a tumor. They refer to a group that has a surgeon, a radiologist, an oncologist, a social worker, etc. They have the benefits of all this expertise, but that group does not take responsibility for the patient. They give advice regarding that patient's tumor. Now, that patient has a tumor, but he's also an heart failure. So he goes to see the cardiology group. And that relationship of one patient, one doctor is broken. Now, I believe that in the specialty society, uh, in in medicine, which has really gone, (laughs) as you say, into interesting channels, I just referred a patient to ear, nose, and throat. And the patient has a nose problem. And they said, the, the the person I knew says, oh, I don't take care of noses. I take care of ears. And -and so-and-so takes care of noses. Uh, So, I mean... Then they make it to that guy, and he says, no, no, I'm the right nostril, not the left nostril. (laughs) The left nostril. (laughs) Uh, That's that's coming. But there has to be somebody who the patient can talk to. And that referring physician in the old days, let's not say, you know, I was a specialist. I was a surgeon. But let's say I was a GP. In the old days, I would refer the patient to the cardiologist, to the uh, surgeon, etc. But they would come back and I would say to them, listen, you have to have this tumor removed. And but, you know, you have problem with your heart. So first, let Dr. So-and-so do this and that and we get you in the best shape. And then you have the tumor surgery. And of course, I'll be there in the hospital to see you. That's a different relationship than you just come to the doctor who's like a triage doctor. Right. And you say, oh, you got a heart, go there, go there, go this. Uh, that, that's a different relationship. And, and that shatters 
that doctor patient relationship yeah and it doesn't work yeah no i that, agree with you i i I always say, I, I've said the story multiple times, but uh, I, I live here in, in Pennsylvania and there's very large systems that, that there's Geisinger locally and various large systems that, that buy up all the independent doctors and, and, and get rid of them essentially, and then put the doctors into their big wheel of 15 minute, 15 minute uh, um, uh, uh, appointments and you, you don't get a doctor. I mean, you, every time it's, it's somebody else, right? You're, I belong to the system and whoever the system has assigned to me that day sees me. So I think that the model, it's funny, as a personal experience, I think the, the model works very, very well for healthy people. So if I have, <laughs> right, so if I, if I have strep or if I have something on, uh, this, something on my skin that I want to get looked at um, and kind of in and out, right, some irritation or something that's, that seems uh, uh, simple, then it's, sure, I walk in, get my number, I'm called in, super efficient, someone random rooms me, someone random sees me, I walk out with my paperwork, here's my height, here's my blood pressure, here's my whatever, here's my medication, goodbye, I'm in and out in 15 minutes, a fantastic experience. But the second a patient is sick, or not even sick, you know, uh, thankfully the, the experience I had was not for, for, for sickness, but when my wife was giving birth, right, and you need, you want, that's when you want a doctor that actually knows who you are. And the two experiences that I had that were just humorous to me was, uh, the, the doctor came into my wife's room and get, started giving her a whole spiel on which vaccine she should take, she shouldn't take. And not to get into the details of, of, of the vaccines, but I just found it humorous that this doctor had walked in. We've never seen this doctor in her life, right? Is our first time. Why would, I, why would I listen to you? We have no relationship. Why are you any different than a web page of, of a random blog post, right? Like there's no credibility built. And then the other thing was I, I have a uh, now four year old son, and um, in Orthodox Judaism we don't we don't cut the hair until the boys are three years old, and so he was about two at the time and he had long hair. And the doctor comes in uh, to see him, and the doctor goes, um, the doctor goes, wow, she's getting so big, <laughs> and he's holding the chart in his hand, and I'm like, you didn't even take a second to look at the chart, you know at least do that much before you walk into, you know, it's one thing you don't know us, but at least look at the chart, you know? So I, I, I agree with you that I agree with you that, 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 that relationship seems to have broken down and it is nice. Um, and in fact, I have a friend that, that became a doctor and I recently got kidney stones and that's when it made me realize I switched over to him right away because I realized if something God forbid actually happens to me, I'm a young guy, thank God I'm in relatively good health. But if, if something were to actually happen, who do I, who do I want to have my chart and to, to be able to make intelligent decisions, someone that actually knows me and cares about me as a human, not a, a, a name on a, on a roster, right? So I, so I agree with you 100%. I, just the, the, the question, I think, is, is, do you think it's practical with the advance of, of medicine and the amount of knowledge that's been amassed um, that's created these subspecialties, right? Do you think it's practical for one provider to really provide that comprehensive care? Well, it at least to be the comprehensive center, at least to uh, put together what the specialists uh, recommend, uh, to be the interpreter. Uh, I, I give you an example. The Mayo Clinic, and we're not associated at the University of Mayo Clinic, we're sort of, I would say rivals, but we're different institutions. And the Mayo Clinic had went into specialization a long, long time ago. But now if you go there, you get assigned a general doctor who sends you here and here and there and then sits down and puts everything together. So they realize that they've got to hold their, and they're a business organization, they've got to hold their clientele by saying, you have a doctor and he's going to put together all the specialists. And so that can, that can exist. Um, you know, you, you, you give your personal experience. Uh, I was fortunate until 2016 when a horse threw me. Uh, I've been riding horses all my life and I'm sort of a, a, a amateur cowboy. I, I would go down to a ranch every year and, and do a roundup, herd the cows, and so on. And, and I've never been thrown my whole life. This horse threw me. And really, I was, he barked. I was high. I broke 11 ribs. 
some in a couple places. My scapula was shattered. My lung was pushed over. I spent 33 days in the hospital. And I was on the patient end for the first time in my life. And I never had a doctor until, well, half of the time was in uh, urgent care in, in, uh, well, in, in the park, part of the hospital where people die. And then I went to rehab. In rehab, I had a doctor. But before that, and he was an older guy, but before that, in the, uh, in the urgent area of the hospital, never had a doctor. Yeah. Different guy walked in every day, said, how are you? And I said, well, just thank you, goodbye. I never had a doctor. You had a chart, that's it. I had a chart, and I ended up, as soon as I could, taking care of myself and calling my uh, guy in Minnesota who runs all the uh, units, the special care units, and having him re- advise me. So I, I felt it in the hospital. And, and, you know, you feel this situation in essence everywhere. I mean, uh, I don't think there is a person out there listening to us who hasn't called to see a doctor that they saw the last time. And first of all, you speak to a robot. Yep. And then the robot gives you another robot. Yep. And maybe a third robot and they hang up. But if you're lucky, you get to an interrogator. Yeah. And they ask you, why are you calling? And why are this? I'm not sure they're even, by HIPAA law, allowed to ask all these personal questions. But they ask you all these questions. And then finally, they say, okay, you can't see your doctor, even though he operated on you last week. You can't see him for two months, even though you're having a problem with the operation. But we'll put you in in this slot because this doctor hasn't got much to do this week and it's for our business model. We'll put you in there. And that's what's happening. And, so and so where where do you think the break is? Do you think the doctor has too many patients? Where do you think the break is in the exact story that you just said? Uh, ask that question again. The, the exact scenario that you just described, right? Patient has operation post-op. They have an issue. They call their, they call the, the, the surgeon that, or the doctor that provided the, this, the, the surgery and the, the practice says, the physician practice says, this doctor doesn't have any room for another two months, but we can put you with this PA or MP or another physician or whatever it is, right? So where, let's diagnose the problem. Does Dr. A, the one that actually provided the operation, does he have too many patients, thus he does not have time for you? What, like, if we, if we could take that exact scenario and put it back 50 years ago where there was a good relationship, where, what would have been the difference? For the patient? No, for the doctor. Like, wh- like, what would have changed that the doctor would have the time to pick up the phone and, and, and talk to you or bring you in right away? Well, several things would have been different. Uh, one, uh, well, let's take one main difference. The doctor worked harder. Today, doctors have set hours. They go home early. They don't come in at night. There's a hospital that covers for them. They have set vacation times. They end at the end of the month and pass it on to somebody else. Now, all this, the business people think is a wonderful model and doctors love it. Well, I'm sure many, many of them do. But the model and and the experiment has failed. Today, you have a national shortage in physicians. We're not seeing enough physicians to go around as our population increases. Yep. And very telling, physicians and doctors, surgeons in every specialty are retiring earlier and earlier. So the model has not worked. And uh, so uh, what's the difference? The doctor had maybe less patients because there were more doctors relative to the patient numbers. And the doctor worked harder. He he didn't go home at four. He stayed at six. And his phone rang at night, and the hospital wasn't there covering for him. Uh, you're paying the hospital this now, whereas the surgeon who did the operation didn't charge you for the 2 a.m. phone call. He did the surgery, and the care was included. 
So if you had trouble, he took care of it. So I'm saying the model, the current model that's been advocated as a wonderful business model, number one, and everybody is happy. I don't think anybody's happy, and I don't think it's a good model. And the statistics show that. And if you give me two minutes, uh, I'd gladly just go over a few statistics. Sure. Okay. There are about seven international um, indices of healthcare. The one we all know about is life expectancy. The United States is 46th. Every uh, European Western country is ahead of us, Australia, New Zealand, and our neighbor Canada. We are 46. Um, giving some numbers, Hong Kong is 82 years average. We are 79. Canada is 81. Uh, and that doesn't sound much, but two or three years, if you're getting to that age, that means a lot. And so, and in every other indice, in people that could have been saved, infant mortality, uh, survival after a heart attack, all this, uh, we are way down on the list. So our system is not the greatest, even though we pay more than anybody else. Uh, and th those are the data. I mean, we live in a world of data and statistics. The statistics show that we are not, as a nation, doing well. And those data are pre-COVID. Look what we did in COVID. For our nation, with our resources, we had the highest mortality per capita. At the moment, 1.1 million deaths. Highest mortality per capita of any nation that we can trust the statistics. I don't know what comes out of Russia or China, but from the nations we can trust, we are the worst. So how can we say that our system is, is okay? It's upside down. So before we get to the, the solution part of this, this conversation, I want to I wanna hear your, your actual human personal experience on one last, on one last piece, because you, I think you made a very interesting observation, which is that today you've got, and you're absolutely right, doctors are becoming employees. They're not really doctors. They want to work for a system. They, they, the doctors that are coming out of medical school, young doctors seem to, or residency seem to want those hours. They don't want to, you know, like you said, they don't want to work hard, so to speak. And yet burnout is through the roof. Whereas 40, 50 years ago, the doctor that you described sounds like a doctor that would get burnt out in exactly seven weeks <laughs> by today's standards. So my question to you, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in why doctors are burnt out today in, in this conversation. I'm interested, why were the doctors not burning out when they were taking those calls and they didn't have a life and they never saw their family and they never went on vacation? Why weren't they burning out at a huge rate? Because they myself included, or answering, you know, and it, it may sound funny, but it's true, a calling. We, we uh, you know, we could have gone into other professions and made more money. We certainly could have gone into un other professions and have shorter hours, but, and, and nobody's going to wake us up at 2 a.m. in the morning, but it was a calling, and it, it, it you did it because of that doctor-patient relationship, the doctor trusted you. So if he called you at two in the morning uh, because he was bleeding after your surgery or something, it was your fault. When I taught my residents, I said, the first thing I'm gonna teach you, everything is your fault. If your patient falls out of bed at night, it's your fault. You should have seen to it that they had bed rails and couldn't fall out of bed. Take responsibility. And so the people who were doctors felt that responsibility, and with it came independence. They made the decision of their hours. They made the decision today. Hospitals often dictate what drugs you can order, yep. what surgery you can do. Yep. They made those decisions. And the feeling of having a profession, a calling, 
where you were an independent decision maker that helped people, made that acceptable. Uh, we didn't talk. I mean, that word burnout came from the business community. The first people, I forgot the names of the two guys who wrote about burnout. and uh, But anyway, it came from the business community. Uh, we didn't have that. Uh, but then now today, uh, I saw a, a wonderful, funny statistics. Somebody interviewed a medical school class and found that 50% said they had burnout. And I said, how can they? They haven't done anything. <laughs> They're already having PTSD. They didn't even do the thing yet. <laughs> how can they have burnout? From what? Yeah. So... That's my answer is that people went into this, maybe uh, went into it for a different reason. And I agree with you, though, and I agree with you with a heavy heart. I interviewed our, some of our residents after they graduated, and they were, these are surgeons, and they were working for a hospital. They were employees, and they were happy. They liked their lives. And so... Yes, unfortunately, in my opinion, the some of a lot of the doctors today like the system, uh, but that still doesn't make it good for the patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at the end of the day, I think that the if I'm if I'm stringing together what you're saying properly, your view is that the the um, economic side of healthcare has created an environment where providers are are working more, looking at the money, not looking at the patient care. And therefore, the whole model has changed and now it's not a calling, it doesn't feel like, you know, it doesn't feel like a, a badge of honor, it's just a job. And then, and then, and that gets, that gets taken out. So my question is going back to, to before, what was, at the end of the day, you were doing a service like, like we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. You were doing a service 40, 50 years ago. I'm talking about at that era, right? You were doing a service and you were billing insurance for that same service, correct? And today, now back then there was no EHRs and there was a lot. So what, what changed? Because today at the end of the day, you're providing a service, you're billing insurance. So to a certain extent, insurance was dictating back then and now how you, know, how you, how you will get paid. When you talk about you know, uh, systems not... Uh, uh, dictating to the doctors what medications they can prescribe and, and how they can do things and, and all that. Is all that new? Did insurances just st just start way overstepping and getting involved? Like where, where was the shift? Because insurances were paying you then and they're paying you now. So what changed in that dynamic that created this environment? Well, uh, several things. First of all, uh, we didn't do all that uh, and our secretaries or billing services didn't do all that calculation. Today, if you, let's say, you go in uh, to resect a tumor of the stomach and the patient has gallstones, you see the gallstones, well, you're not going to leave it, take out the gallbladder. So when you're charged, you said gastric surgery and so on. That was it. Today, you got to put took out the gallbladder, and then you have to answer, why did you take out the gallbladder? It wasn't hurting the guy, but you have to explain that gallstones, and sooner or later, I'm there, it doesn't need the gallbladder, and it's, good. it's, it's the good thing to do. So yeah. the paperwork that's necessary to get paid has multiplied many fold. That, that's one thing. And... Um, The other part of it is that the doctor no longer, when, when you say has that feeling, you, you use the word provider. I never was a provider. I don't think of a, pro, I'm a provider. Uh, a provider is somebody else. I'm a doctor. And the vocabulary has changed. A uh, number of years ago at our hospital, instead of calling nursing stations, nursing stations, they started to be called firms. And firms, F-I-R-M, like, like, 
like a firm that sells you toothpaste or something. We were called firms. Hmm. And we were called providers, not doctors. And the doctors didn't object too much because we were providing. But there was a reason for that. Because now the patients no longer were called patients. They were called clients. <laughs> so we are providers working for a firm to take care of our clients. And that changes the entire d dynamic. And I don't, uh, did I answer your question in that respect? Yeah, yeah, you did. The difference is, the difference is that the paperwork became more and that the insurance seems to have gotten much, much, much more involved. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question, and I think we might need to do a part two, Doc, because I think that there's a lot. We might have to do a part two of this, this podcast episode, because I think that we have 10 minutes left, and I think that this might, this might, uh, this is a much larger conversation, but it would seem to me that the more socialized you go with the medicine, the more paperwork you're going to have to do. And the more you're going to move in a direction where somebody at the top that's never seen a patient in their life is going to be dictating that entire, uh, that entire process of how you get paid and specifically what you get paid for and how much. So, uh, it would seem to me that that would be the logical process. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's an illogical process, but yes, this is, it's, it's happening and, and take it away from pay at the moment, take it away from money, take it away from patient care. In the past, let us say, uh, a young, well, it doesn't have to be young, a doctor in a specialty, um, let's say a surgeon, okay? I know surgery best. A, a surgeon was responsible for his actions to a chair of that department or head of that department. And who was that person? A more experienced surgeon. Well, today, the surgeon no longer is. He belongs to a service group. He belongs to the cancer group. And so his job is to take out the cancer where the oncologist gives chemotherapy and so on. So he's no longer responsible for his surgery to a surgeon, a more senior surgeon. He's responsible to the man who runs the service group who happens to be an oncologist. Now, the oncologist is responsible to the head of the hospital or the dean. Now, that may have been a former doctor, maybe a pediatrician. Right. And so the surgeon is responsible to an oncologist who is responsible to a pediatrician. Now, does that sound as good as the surgeon responsible to a senior surgeon who would say to him, Maybe you can do this better. Maybe you can do this. The pediatrician is going to tell the oncologist who's going to tell the surgeon how to become a better surgeon? No. And often the head of the hospital isn't even a doctor. He's a businessman. And he's been selected because he has known how in the past to make a business profitable. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. The person who runs an organization should be somebody who has an empathy for the patient. It, it's different. I don't care if somebody makes a new hula hoop and becomes a multi-billionaire because he sells his hula hoop. That's capitalism. Wonderful. But I don't think you should become a billionaire by regulating health care, making it the most uh, financially responsible by shifting physicians and so on. In other words, giving poorer service to a patient to make more money. That I don't think I like. Okay. So, I mean, there's two sides to that coin. There's, there's thinking that you shouldn't be able to become wealthy off being a doctor. And then there's thinking that a patient shouldn't have worse care because you want to make money, which I think the latter part, everyone would agree with you. Um, I think that the former, I think, would be a great uh, debate discussion for part two, like I said. But as an overview for the last couple minutes that we have, 
as such, what is your thoughts to a move towards value-based care? Because it would seem to me that it's, it's that my, my thought about what? value-based okay. care as a, as a payment model. Um, are, are you familiar? Uh, that is pay if you do something good. So value-based care in very, very, very overview is that instead of fee for service where patient breaks leg, doctor fixes leg, doctor gets paid, right? Instead of that, the insurances basically come to the doctor and they say, we're going to give you 10 bucks for, uh, for, for Henry's healthcare, but we're going to give you 10 bucks for 10,000 Henry's healthcare. Right. And, but now you are responsible for Henry's healthcare from beginning to end every surgery, every hospital stay, every, everything you are responsible. So what you do is you basically shift the entire uh, incentive structure, because I, I think that taking money, and again, I, I, I want to have this out properly, but I think that taking money out of the equation um, is, uh, is whatever, debate for another time. But this way, you leave money in the equation, but you create the incentive, even the financial incentive for the doctor to provide the best care for the patient, because the doctor now has to say, okay, where in a fee for service world, an example would be in a fee for service world, the doctor um, is actually incentivized for the patient to be sick because every time the patient's sick, doctor gets paid, right? So the doctor's not going to spend any time, money, or resources of his own or the hospital or the system of their own to provide preventive care for that patient to try to make sure that the steps are in place so that we're proactive about the patient's health care instead of solely reactive because they want to be reactive because reactive means money, right? When you take the full responsibility, and it's called a risk-based contract, when you take the full responsibility for that patient's care, you basically, it completely shifts. And now I, as a system, will take money out of my pocket and pay a care coordinator, uh, and, uh, you know, 10 bucks that month to pick up the phone and call the patient for a monthly call and talk to the patient and go through care gaps. And then while talking to the patient, we find out that the patient doesn't have a bar in her shower. And then... We spend a little, couple more bucks to coordinate that a bar gets put in her shower. And now statistically, we just saved that patient from falling, slipping, and breaking her, her hip. And now I have to pay because now I would have to pay for a hip replacement surgery, which is going to cost me $150,000 because I took the responsibility over that patient's care. So I will gladly spend 100 bucks in proactive in order to save myself um, on patients actually getting sick and being in the, in, in the ER and, 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 and staying in the hospital. So I think it's a model where where you can really bring both. You can leave financial incentive in the system, but you can realign it to align with patient care. We're running out of time. Three quick answers. Sure. Number one, uh, I'm not against physicians making money or administrators, but it, it's the where they're making the money from, at whose expense. And... I don't think a CEO of a hospital needs to take home $40 billion a year. I mean, that's a little different than taking home, let's say, a million, but $40 million or $26 million or something. That's a big difference. And that money comes out of the hides of patient care in the end. Uh, number two, this model, what you're saying, is, is what's called bundling, uh, in a sense, that you pass on the responsibility and the person thinks they can make a profit by taking on the responsibility. That can work in reverse too. They can say, oh, I got the money. I'm not going to do any of this and I'll make a lot of money for doing nothing. And, and so it's a two-way street. I, I, I think the, the incentive has to be to give the best care and not to make the most money or in that sense. And in a sense, uh, I've written a lot about the history of medicine. And you have gone back to an ancient Chinese model. In ancient China, they used to pay physicians, uh, or the, the, uh, the patient paid the physician to keep him healthy. And if the patient got sick, he stopped paying the physician. Okay. So the physician only got paid if the patient was healthy. Yep. And, and in, yeah, a sense you're saying, in a sense, you're saying that, but it can re work in reverse too. You but historically, care. did it work out for the Chinese? Well, they didn't know. The Chinese went away from that model. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a few thousand years ago. Yep. They had physicians and, and they paid the physicians to keep them well. Mm-hmm. 
If they got sick, the physician failed. Right. I mean, it's like paying to keep your automobile running. Yep. Yep. Incredible. Um, Dr. Buckwald, uh, I, I, I really, you know, we are going to schedule part two. If you're up for it, I think we'll start with the three things that you just mentioned. You're an absolutely fascinating person to talk to. You're an interesting combination, obviously, because you're a doctor, you're a surgeon, but you're also a professor. So you, uh, there, there, there's a lot there and, and, a, and, and an author. Um, but uh, for our listeners out there, where can they find you? Where could they find your book? Uh, most importantly, clearly, you're a very thought through person. So uh, where, where can people find you? Well, they could find my book. Um, just go to Google, and there's various companies that advertise it, Amazon, and uh, online it's available every, in many, many places. Uh, the publisher is Springer, so they can directly send it to you. Um, and I don't know what bookstores it's in, but it's in Barnes & Nobles. It's in, it's in bookstores. And it's called, here, I'll show it. Can you see it? Let's see. Healthcare Upside Down, a critical examination of? It's not a big book. It's a, it's a small book. It starts with statistics, goes on to that language that we are no longer doctors, but we are providers for people who are our clients. And then it goes through the clinic and everything else. And as I said, we don't have time today. But 10 suggestions of never can go back to the past, but how we can get into the future. And, and the, the thing, the average American has to say, enough's enough. Uh, I'm getting cheated. I'm not getting what I'm paying for. How can we fix this? And it can be fixed. It can Amazing. be fixed. And the first thing one has to do is, is realize that it's broke. I mean, if you remember the Hans Christian Andersen tale of, of the emperor without any clothing, I mean, he walked along naked and his retainers were holding an imaginary cloak and everybody said, oh, that's wonderful. One little boy said, he's not wearing any clothes. And everybody said, hear him, hear him. Well, maybe I'm the little boy who says he's not wearing any clothes. Gotcha. And it's time to hear. Amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for part two with Dr. Buckwald. And uh, until then, Doc, thank you so much for sitting with us today. Been my pleasure, Mendel. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.